Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Inside Movies Galore. I'm your host, David Streggy, and here in the room, we have the Inside Movies Galore crew. Welcome back, everyone. Oh, it's Hello. weird. It's like we've done this before in a dream or something. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, let's grab the beers and go down to the beach. Anyways. It's a loft, not a basement. So, um, I... Uh, uh, Red Raven said that she wanted to uh, tell the tale that we, or the uh, tale of the, the the movie premise tonight. So why don't you uh, we start with you, Red Raven? Yeah. Um, so the movie starts off with um, what is the this, movie? The movie is um, Night of or Return of the Living Dead Part Two, mm -hmm. and it was uh, filmed in uh, what 1988. A seven. Eighty seven. Eighty eight release, wasn't it? Eighty eight release, yeah. And um basically it starts off where this truck dumps a barrel under a bridge and um the next day or so some kids are fighting around the area where the barrel was and uh they see the zombie inside okay. and um, the next day I think two more of the of those boys go down there and they release some of that gas that tux trioxin and I yeah it's basically like the zombie gas yeah uh, from the corpses Trial. and that starts releasing um, the zombies once again and um, but one of the little boys who came in contact with with the gas, I think, one one of the boys starts already, you know, turning into a zombie. And um, as it prolongs, you know, uh, some of the people, the characters get bit. And then um, they're just chasing zombies the whole entire movie trying to figure out how to you know, get away from these zombies, you know, they go to a, uh, a hospital where no one's there, and they're trying to, you know, keep away over there, and they just can't get away from these uh, zombies, and that's okay. basically like the same kind of plot we had in the last movie, just yeah. different storyline. It's very, it's very similar to the previous uh, the Return of the Living Dead uh, that was done by people who wanted to make the movie. Uh, so I saw this on the Shout Factory Blu-ray, which had a lot of behind-the-scenes like, making of content. And boy, a lot of people had some pretty strong opinions about how this production was handled, uh, to put it politely. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, who are we going to start with? So. Uh, did somebody else want to start, or should I just go? So we should just organically talk about it. Whatever. <laughs> so, just Jill quick... had many strong feelings about it, so... Uh, oh, really? Did Jill yeah. see well, part one? Yes, she did. Okay. First of all, Jill, welcome back to the show. Um, it's been quite a while. Thank you guys so much. I know I've been so busy producing <laughs> and acting and recording my album that... Honestly, half the time I don't even know what day it is, but I do know that every I'm Tuesday like inside movie day. tour. So, <laughs> so uh, you watched the film, correct? I did, and I actually watched the first. But it was funny because I wanted to be on last, but I have a few deadlines that are like urgent that I had to meet, so I, I didn't want to not. I didn't want to be on the podcast and be like, well, they watched part of it, and then say, like, I know everything, because I, I didn't, but I ended up actually watching it, because my office is right in front of the TV. <laughs> so, Convenient. Uh, yeah, I know. It was so funny, because I was like, I'm gonna focus, and then every five minutes, I found myself turning around. I was like, well, at this point, I might as well just watch it. But, um, you know, it's funny, because just me as a person, you know, this is not saying anything because I'm a film producer and, you know, I love art and I love art from all genres and all ages. I think that we've morphed into this technologic age. And so to look back at quote unquote, what I call not many people, but vintage films, you know what I mean? Um, the 80s films, the cheap graphics kind of thing. I've never really been a fan of 80s films and I never. The fuck? 
Yeah. Well, and I've never really understood why, but here's the thing is so I've never been really a big fan of zombies. And so I, that's why I wanted to kind of watch it because I was like, well, it's something outside of my comfort zone. It's something I'm not used to. So why not give it a chance? So I did. And honestly, like, so for the first one, I did like the first one because the plot, I understood the plot. It was like, okay, the rain activates it and like that's all everything. And believe it or not, everyone kind of agreed last week that they, uh, we all enjoyed it. Uh, it first one so well the first exactly. one is such a strong classic i mean it's it i'd be surprised if people didn't like it and i did i actually loved it and so and i had heard about it for years so this week when he was like well okay we're gonna watch the second one i was like okay and i sat down and i was like okay let's start it and i felt honestly just because i had just seen the i had just seen the film for the first time last week Going a week later, it was like watching the same movie, honestly, um, with different. It, and the There's thing a is, reason. it's the same plot with different characters. But Dane pointed out that the same people that were in the last movie are playing different characters in this movie. And I'm thinking, if you're going to have a sequel, you might as well just keep the same characters, um, which that was one thing that, you know, stood out to me. But there were just like little things like if you're going to do a sequel, you know, try to change it up a bit, which with the electricity they did. And I did see that. Um, but there were just things I think with the one liners that the um, kids did and with Ed, I think Ed's character was just so over dramatic and almost took away from his character. And then the one liners where they would like put the gun in the belt and be like one liner inserted here. It's like it wasn't, the one-liner was good, but not for that scene where they put it at. And so I felt like when the cheapy one-liners or whatever was going on, it was just like, it kind of took away from the moment. Because it's like, instead of focusing on the scene, you're like, what? why the hell did they say that? What did that even mean? And why is this kid, you know, trying to be like badass? Which I understand he's like, why is he being badass? But the things that they were having him say, it's just, it didn't fit. It didn't fit with his personality. It was almost like this nerdy kid is trying to be like the next, which I guess fits in superhero. But at the same time, they just would put it off. It just didn't come off as clean. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. This that movie definitely tried way first. too hard. Yes, it was Be like funny. everybody was over dramatic and like um, yeah. the redhead. She just every time she screamed, it was like flailing the arms and screaming over the top. And it was just, I felt like is art like to watch it. I understand the plot, but it's like, I felt like every actor was trying so hard to be them, their character that it kind of took away from the film. And it's almost like, why are you trying so hard to stop? It's okay. And I don't know, I guess that was my feelings for this second sequel. <laughs> well, this had a particularly not great kind of production story behind it uh, so there's a lot of reason there's a there's a big reason why it's so similar like from some of the behind the scenes stuff i found it sounded like the original version of the script was almost like just a direct copy of the first movie yeah uh, some people said it was like plagiarism of uh, the first script. except yeah. worse that, that first, supposedly that first draft had several scenes just literally taken right from the first one to the point where, like, they got in trouble right away. Like, Dan O'Bannon wanted no involvement in this was because he was, like, pissed about, you know, issues like that. Um, plus, I personally really hate this director, like, the more, like, I learned about him. Like, he was one of those directors who's like, uh, horror movies suck, I'll just do it to, you know, maybe get a, a shot at another project that's not horror. And, and the people on the film picked up on it too. Everyone on the like, cast was upset yeah. about it. Yeah, it like, wasn't like he did it secretly. Like everybody knew he wasn't feeling it. Well, and when that happens from the top, and it just spills down into the, yeah. through the ranks. What's funny is that this director—he's the actually director of another classic uh, called Shockwave, um, which um, uh, there's a lot of called. A, fan, a fanatic for that film as well um, fr uh, from the 80s uh, 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 he did that one a little bit before this one so um and, uh, they mentioned that yeah that's what he was 
it, it's kind of weird. Like he said, it's like, well, you know, it's easy to get started doing a horror movie. So I did a horror movie, and then the people only wanted me to do horror movies because like, you made a good one, idiot. That's why. Uh, and then he just seemed completely resistant to it. Like he finally seemed to. It, from IMDb, it looked like he gave up directing around ninety three, ninety eight, something like that. Which. Uh, kind of good riddance, frankly, because, I mean, if you have that little enthusiasm for your projects that go well, like, are you even in the right business? <laughs> well, actually, yeah, along those lines, I kind of, um, as far as the acting in this one goes, uh, I'm not sure I would term it as the actors trying too hard. It was almost more like most of them didn't seem to care. And I think it yeah. was probably because the director apparently didn't care. And I felt like, like for example, the two that play the bumbling kind of fools that, you know, they, uh, uh, what was it, Ed and... Uh, Joey. Yeah. yeah. They were they were basically the characters from the first film. But the first time around, I thought they were really funny. And this time around, I really felt like they were half-assing it. And it just... They, they, Ed spent the whole time just kind of whining, 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 and I'm like, ah, oh, geez, no, you did better last time. Yeah, they were, <laughs> but all of the actors were, except, uh, ironically enough, except for the kid who he has his own, the main character, he has his own acting issues, but like all the adults were, it was kind of the dictionary definition of mugging to I the will, camera, but I like. Will, though. The phoning it in aspect worked for the doctor. He was. Yeah. <laughs> but like, I, I, my fa one of my favorite things about the movie was the kid protagonist, just because I felt like he was fairly well written, comparatively speaking. Except that um, the the actor that they got was he really wasn't very good, despite the fact that the character was written fairly well. Um, <laughs> but I thought uh, he did fine. He was he was okay. I, I've seen a lot better child performances, but he was one of the better actors out of the whole bunch, which was not saying much. But uh, you know, he uh, I liked the way his character was written. He was a bit craftier than your typical child protagonist. Brandon, I, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I do think one thing. Speaking on what he just said, you know, when he when they were talking about Ed being whiny, it did make sense because it's like. I feel like, and, and this is stereotypical, so of course it's, you know, not going to make sense, but it will. If you're going to have a male character that's like, quote unquote, one of the main cast, and he's a male, and he's like one of the bigger guys on set, I felt like in the story, he shouldn't be the one going, ah, and like whining. It's like, out of anybody, let it be a woman or let it be the kid, which I get why the kid was like the quote unquote superhero at the same time because I feel like it took away from his character aspect and when he said that it kind of made me realize like if anybody's going to find it let it be a female and kind of be part of their character if that makes sense I, I disagree um, with that uh, what? <laughs> about it being needing to be a female or a child like the whining was excessive but I think it was mainly due to the fact that um he played that sort of whiny character better, you know, um, it, as as Frank, not as Ed, you know, as Frank in the first film. And that they just pretty much took that same character and just did a generic bastardized version of it the second time through. And I think that's probably more why that the whining just doesn't fit the right way it wasn't a good thing and i i don't think they needed it at all as much as they had it and i yeah. would have been equally annoyed had it been a female or a child doing it and yeah, I, I don't think that, I don't that's really pretty like actually of... sexist i thought it i thought it worked <laughs> fine uh to see him just like totally like there was a it, i thought it was fine to have at least one character who was like just flipping out at the craziness of the situation yeah. and I, out, why did they have to be him but, again you know what i'm saying like well, they just flip, flipping out well fine, before he kind of kept, just he kinda kept it together in the first movie uh he but kind of did better just... but his and his whining was like just timed right and the right kind of uh, where it was comedic more than anything. I think he was a more interesting character the first time around. He, you know, he was flip and he was sarcastic, but <laughs> he just this guy who worked in a medical warehouse, 
And this time around, he just played a shallow, greedy grave robber. You just didn't like him as much from the very get-go. Yeah, yeah, I was definitely not invested in that those two characters at all, like their success or their failure, as much as I was in the first movie. And of course, you know, I'm partial to the first one because it's my favorite, but I, I'm definitely not as invested. Like, eh, I don't really care what happens to them. Like, they weren't as endearing as characters mm -hmm. in this one. Well, the level of writing talent, like, behind this one was so unbelievably inferior, like... Right, right. To Dan now, Dustin, are you not glad that we did the first one first? Uh, I mean, I thought this movie was okay. Like, I'm... I give it a bit more of a pass. I'm, yeah, I'm happy we did the first one first, because it's definitely a better movie. Um, I mean, you can make the argument that it's essentially the same movie, which, again, because of the way this was written and produced, it sort of was. Uh, like, it's, uh, well, in one of the commentaries, they described it like what they did for Evil Dead, you know, how Evil Dead 2 is more or less the same as Evil Dead, as the first Evil Dead. It was, it's kind of like that reboot. in this scenario. What? It feels like a soft reboot. But exactly. they but, but a terribly, terribly done soft reboot. <laughs> like, as more of like a comedy, like, I, I was calling this, e I yeah. was calling this Return of the Living Dead for kids. Uh, yeah. And like doing some <laughs> doing some digging, it sounds like um, this would have actually gotten a PG thirteen if they had trimmed the scene where the zombie gets blown in half in the hospital. Like mm -hmm. that's how uh, low tier this was. Uh, yeah. And it is one that I saw as a kid. So <laughs> what does Actually, that tell you? I did have a point on that. Uh, this was my first time watching it, and I kept thinking to myself. Why is it that many people point at this one as the uh, quintessential favorite of the three? Well, five. They do? Yeah, um, who does that? Uh, wasn't it you two? I could have sworn you and Dustin were both saying this was the second was the better one. Did I miss you? Oh, God, no. No. Did I say that? No. 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 <laughs> I would have I never hope that. I didn't. I certainly hope I didn't say that. I mean, like, I like this movie fine, but I don't know if... You you were gung ho on this one uh, when we, uh, when we when you first brought this up. Uh, uh, so, well, I wanted an excuse to see it because I had just bought the Blu-ray. <laughs> <laughs> well, the to oh. me, I looked at this one. I mean, the first one had more of a, I mean had that trauma esque vibe. This one to me had none of that trauma esque vibe. It no. I know reminded the director, me. The director himself used the phrase paint by numbers when he was talking about it. Well, that's, what it, that's comforting. That's a vote of confidence. <laughs> what it reminded me of, really, uh, it's like I looked at it and it's like, I've seen this film before. It's just shades of all of these different kind of kitty horror films of the 80s. Uh, much better films like Gremlins or House or House 2, the second story. All of that really, this is, to me, that film goes a lot lo a lot better with those films. Uh, it really reminds me a lot more of that genre. Like he what movie? You said Warhouse? And this is House. Movie. Oh, just House. Yeah, yeah, House. House and House 2. Not, not the Japanese one. Okay. Though we should cover that on the show one of these days because that is a truly gruesome horror film. Um, really but uh, the a pretty uh, old one, yeah, seventy-seven. Yeah. But as far as uh, but I'm talking about the ones with uh, you know Norm from Cheers. Yeah, the one with Norm and the one with Cliff. <laughs> yep. So, uh, but that sort of kind of goofy uh, horror movie, but not goofy in the trauma sense. Troma had its own brand of goofy, and I was, uh, I was, when I looked at it, which goes along with that, or Slime City, or some of those, that's what the first film did. But this one, this one, like I said, it sounded, it felt much more in the tone, line of the tone of the mainstream horror of the 80s film, uh, the PG horror of the 80s film. Well, that's kind of what it was designed as because the director kept making the making the comment that he wanted to try to use this as a way. He said he went so far into comedy because he wanted to stop making horror, and then he was like upset because he's because according to him, then people only wanted me to do horror comedies. And it's like, wow, just wow. Well, believe it or not, this was uh, a first time watch for me as well. He, 
Really? I, I actually do not remember this film at all. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so uh, watch, watching it, I'm like, okay, I, I don't remember this at all. And, and normally, I'm uh, I'm pretty good at remembering movies that I've seen and, and picking out actors and actresses that I've seen them in. Uh, so, <laughs> if I've seen the movie, I knew it. <laughs> but um, I, I, I'd like to pick up on some of the uh, things that. Um, that I enjoyed enjoyed about the film, like I enjoyed uh, the uh, part where you see the spineless bottom walking around. That was that was kind of goofy. Uh, I, if they if they had dragged that out a little bit longer, and he, and if he did, that uh, other half of him would have been like uh, uh, like walking after it, like bring back my bottom or something like that. I would have enjoyed that a little better. Well, he did kind of go after it. <laughs> Yeah, but they, like he ran into the wall. They didn't drag it out uh, a little bit longer, and I, I would, uh, I would have, I would have wanted that. Or, or the part where where the hand got cut off in the car, everybody was screaming. That's that's another thing about this film is that it was really like the first one because I remember watching it and Jill was like, "Turn it down, it's too loud," and uh, it was loud, but it was mostly because of music, which was really good music. And the music in this was was good too. It wasn't as good as the first one, but you know. It was well, which version did you see? Because yeah, you know, I saw some... the the Shout Factory one, which I think has the original music. Yeah, yeah, it has the real music. Um, on one of the yeah. on the director commentary, you can hear like the music that it was repl- that the originals were replaced with, and holy shit, <laughs> it's so mm-hmm. bad. Yeah, but but my point is that I felt like this film was possibly even noisier uh but that's mostly because of the screaming and like the near constant screaming that didn't need to be yeah. there by the way David, and and jill is being surprisingly modest right now because she was very vocal in her dislike of this <laughs> all during the thing thank you dane <laughs> Dave, the uh the copy i watched the copy you sent the link to yep was, and that, that's know, not the shout factory one that was the shout release? No, it was not. That was not. Yeah, I will admit, I thought the music was a huge step down. And then when I saw an IMDb, they replaced most of the music. I was like, okay, that explains it. <laughs> the music um, was a big part of the first one. <laughs> you can tell if uh, when they're coming out of the graveyard, instead of the trioxin theme from the first movie, you hear this like totally weird... I don't even know how to describe it, like, kind of synthy thing. Like, it was... That was when I first noticed, like, oh, this isn't the real music. When they were, uh, when they were first coming to and, and coming yeah. out. Yeah. Actually, that was one part where I liked the humor, where they had, like, the one that came out and then fell into They're another... Stepping on them. The one that kept getting stepped on. Yeah. yeah. That was great. Yeah. Like speaking, of, speaking of kids, did anybody else... I don't know if anyone else thought of this, but particularly the kid with the slick back hair and the braces, like those two kids in the beginning, like the big ones, they, they kind of reminded me of Beavis and Butthead and the, the slick back hair kid with the braces reminded me a lot of Butthead because he looked a bit like that. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, that you mentioned that. I didn't catch that, but yeah, I can see it. That that would have dramatically improved the movie if those if it had been Beavis and yeah. Butthead in the movie. <laughs> they had like a dynamic. <laughs> like a if they would have really committed to a slapstick film, which is like they would do those the hints of slapstick, but they didn't ever really commit to it. I yeah. think because you know cause had they Beavis, committed to it, it'd have been a better movie. Did Beavis and Butthead ever do like a zombie episode or a horror episode, like something that wasn't like a hallucination, mm-hmm. like in the movie? Because I... if not. If not, then that would have been great. Actually, wait, yeah, yes, they so. did in the in the recent season. They did like some werewolf thing or something. Mm. But I, all I was thinking was like, I was like, I really wish that this was a Beavis and Butthead movie with zombies <laughs> in it because that would have been great. But yeah, this somebody could go and do that though. They, they would. Should. They should. I mean, they did it with Steve Earl with, with Snakes Out of Compton. Like, like, <laughs> like the like the little kid hero at the center of it. His sister, Beavis, Beavis, would probably look intelligent next to her. Yeah, I was going to say, Beavis and Butthead are like geniuses compared to a lot of the characters in this. Well, a lot of the characters were just uh, stereotype characters from the majority, I mean, cookie-cutter characters. I mean, the kid was the 
I'm that kid who's going to do stupid stuff and deliberately get into trouble, even though I'm not as dumb as I act. At yeah. Times. Well, he and he did. Uh, he, he was got, a really competent character. I'm kind of well, surprised to be well, hearing all this. Well, he got he got my respect early on because he pulled out Peter Parker, the Spectacular Spider-Man. I was like, yeah, I like this kid already. Well, I and, also. Uh, I, I he 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 was fairly crafty, but he also did some stupid things at the same time. Just for the I sake mean, of it's like that kid continues. in um, the stuff. He climbs into the tanker where they're going to dump it all. Uh, <laughs> it's. It's the same basic thing. He ends up triggering, uh, in several points, he ends up triggering the zombies to come after him when he decides he's going to go off on his own and do his own thing. Yeah, dumbass. And uh, just the spunky kid is just, I think it was an overused thing. It's almost like when they had Feast and uh, in the movie Feast where they're like, uh, they wouldn't kill a kid. <laughs> Would they? <laughs> I'm thinking maybe they would. Maybe. <laughs> I think the same kid. The same kid was in the blob, and was he the kid that got killed by the blob? By the blob? The Your 80s blob? version. The yeah. 80s version. Uh, I'd be an old kid if it was the other version. <laughs> yeah. I'd be impressed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I grew up with the classic blob, so. Uh, so uh, the... the 80s one is honestly pretty good. It's like. You'll be if you've never seen it, see it. You'll be impressed. Yeah, I, oh, I, I, would, good. I would. I wouldn't mind seeing it just because I. I really enjoyed. I grew it's up very, with all the all the it's classic. Very, it's very graphic and nasty. Yeah, I grew up but, with class with like classic, you know, Universal monsters and you know stuff from the fifties and like that was that's what I grew up with. <laughs> but it doesn't have that fun song. Uh, that's at the uh, original one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the Burt Bacharach song. <laughs> it was. It was written. I don't know. I personally, I really, I really like the song that plays in the credits for the remake. It has. It seems to have nothing to do with the actual movie itself. It's just like a cool '80s song. <laughs> so, speaking of '80s music and going back to the idea of that comic box, it was I seeing things. It was so brief. I feel like when he opened the box, the first comic on the front was the Dazzler comic. Yes, it was. So, there was Dazzler. There was. Uh, I was looking for him to pull out some tales from the crypt. Uh, uh, that would have been a little too obvious. Though, <laughs> well, this director, this director hated horror so much. I would bet money he didn't know what tales from the crypt was. <laughs> uh, I, I was just looking at it and saying, "Oh my God, why would you keep your comics that way?" Uh, yeah, put some like bags and boards on those things. They're all frayed and stuff. <laughs> Back in the day, that's how a lot of people did do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but yeah, I, he's like I, I like the kid 11. from the beginning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, I, I like the kid from the beginning because he, because I had comics from that era when I was a kid as well. Because I we would go antiquing and uh, would I got get some old uh, old Marvel comics of, from that age. <laughs> Which, ah. Well, well, a few, just very quickly, a few things that I, overall, I didn't think it was a good movie, really, but I've seen a whole lot worse. Um, mm -hmm. There were some things that I thought were kind of neat, like, uh, I liked that they didn't have to re-explain the rules to us. I liked that uh, the tar monster came back for, like, one one scene, uh, and I did, I, and I really liked, I think my number one favorite thing about it was, Unlike, say, Frankenstein, where electricity, in almost every interpretation of the story, electricity brings life to a dead corpse. Um, here, electricity kills the dead corpses, which is like, oh, that's neat. And, and, I, and I remember saying to Jill, like, so they should just freeze them or use a flamethrower. And at the very end, they use a flamethrower. It's like, oh, wow, that, couldn't you have thought that, of that first before you nuked them in the first one? Didn't electricity <laughs> kill Godzilla in a film, too? Um, uh, it hurt. It hurt Godzilla in Godzilla vs. King Kong. Like yeah, for some reason, it, King Kong gained electricity superpowers and used them on yeah, cause, Godzilla. Because yeah. that was supposed to be Frankenstein's monster there, uh, yeah. but then they changed it to King Kong because of more name recognition and because it was the American monster versus the Japanese monster. But um, yeah, I, I thought that was refreshing because I've never quite seen electricity kill zombies before, but. At the same time, you know, these are a different breed of zombies than your typical one. And also, this was the first film I've ever seen where zombies actually drive a car, which is cool. Mm -hmm. 
and like go on a joy ride. <laughs> yeah, they they kill the army guys and turn yeah. their jeep into like the party wagon. Like that was that was a fun. This movie yeah, has that... a lot of fun moments like that. Like I'll give it that. Yeah, well, they, were, cool. they were very sporadic and not that well integrated into the plot. And maybe but they me were they were there. Being, maybe me just being male uh, uh, when you see the sister for the first time and she's got that exercise shirt on, <laughs> so that she's not wearing a bra. Mm. <laughs> I wasn't Which, really looking, but all right. Well, the I was looking at that scene, but for a different reason. I was looking at it for the reason of the obligatory. It's an '80s movie, so we got to have a scene where a character is watching an exercise video because that was the fitness craze. I was sitting there going, "You can get more '80s than uh, than that outfit." <laughs> well, yeah. Exercise video, uh, 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 video um, distracts a zombie. Uh, that, that oh, was, yeah. That I was, was so funny. hoping that at some point they would have done something with that. You know, I think I the first time I remember watching this as an adult, I was like, yeah, they could have really took it, that and ran with it, made the zombies do aerobics or something. Well, they did uh, They did do a kind of a throw-up uh, to uh, uh, Michael Jackson's thriller in here. Oh, yeah. yeah. I want to I wanna tell that story, because that's a great that, story. That made Jill just, like, go, oh, come on. <laughs> that's my, that's well, my there, favorite part. Like, didn't we say in the first one that there was kind of a send-up to it, too? Uh, I, yeah. Well, don't remember. I don't think in the first one. Um, I mentioned the, I mentioned that as being one of my favorite things from the second one. Um, yeah, you did. So yeah, right. There turned out to be a whole. There turned out to be a whole big history to it. Like somebody, somebody on the crew like had that jacket, and they were like, "Hey, wouldn't it be really funny if we like we did this like gag?" And the director, of course, was like, "Yo, that sucks. Let's. I don't even want to try it." And so, kind of behind his back, like they had someone like. They put him in the makeup. They put him in the outfit, and they then actually, when they were shooting, he Brian was just like, Peck, no. who was in the first movie, played that zombie. Brian Peck, who plays Scuzz in the first movie, plays yeah. the thriller zombie in part two. It's, he plays a and, bunch of other zombies in part two, also. And how how lazy was it that they brought the two actors back from the first one? They had him play different characters. They had the one guy uh, signify that this all seems so familiar. And they don't do anything with it because I was almost wondering, oh, are they like reincarnated or something? And then they didn't do anything with it. It was just well, like some they wanted to have joke. the original, some of the original cast and or characters in it, but it just didn't quite develop that way. Like they were able to get those people from the first cast, just not quite. Uh, well, with like any kind it was of supposed to be to it. kind of like how American Horror Story is like the same people each season but they they play different characters that was kind of what they were going for but then um from watching that documentary or whatever they the people who didn't get asked to come back were like surprised because they thought they just would but it turned out they didn't and don kalfa actually uh went in there he thought he was just going in to have a meeting with um the directors or whatever he ended up having to read for the part of that doc character in part two and he didn't get it he lost it to the guy who obviously got the role but he thought he was just going in like it was automatic you're in um but that had all kind of changed on well, them so you know i found what i found general genuinely offensive was on the i was watching the commentary with the director uh a little while before we started and the director he was talking about how, you know, oh, Return of the Living Dead, Dan O'Bannon, like, it was great. I loved it. I thought it was brilliant. And then, like, every decision that he made in during the creation of this movie seems to just completely disregard, like, the stuff and the act, the things and the actors and the characters that and the dynamics that made the first one work so well. It was like, oh, yeah, I love and respect the movie, like, but I don't really give a shit, so... Paint doesn't my mean he can replicate it. Doesn't mean he could do it justice just because he likes it. You know, I just... I think you hit the nail on the head with saying he's not that great of a director, you know? Like, especially not for a horror project that he wasn't really that into in the first place. You know, he just... He wasn't feeling it, and, and it showed painfully. Yeah, that... The lack of caring will trickle down like crazy. Like, as 
Well, maybe we should try talking about some positive things, like the effects. The effects were pretty good, right? Except yes. for the Tarman. Yes. Yeah, they, the Tarman was horrible. They were well, they were... They the were... actor's mouth in the fucking Tarman's mouth. What the hell was that? Mm. Yeah, the, the effects weren't as bad as I was expecting, because usually it's one of those things where, like, you know, you have a... Uh, person who like the creative team isn't the same and you know it's not got a lot to do with the first one so you think oh you know they're just gonna skimp out on the effects and you know they they weren't as uh different as i thought they were gonna be they weren't as good but they it wasn't like a giant quality drop off or anything oh i actually think it was an increase in quality in terms of um the effects in the second movie like there was there was some really detailed work being done like we had in the first one we had the the half corpse and stuff like that but you see a lot of that um in the second one especially uh like in the scene where the guy gets like shot in half or whatever there's a lot of really good gore and i think um a lot more detailed faces especially there was a lot of just kind of slapped together painted faces in the first one which it, it really fits the campiness of the film but I think this one needed those special effects to sort of make up for the the storyline being kind of caca and it just mm-hmm. being boring. Yeah. So I think they, they definitely stepped it up in the makeup department and did some really cool effects. Um, and I particularly enjoyed the annoying severed head, southern accent, severed head lady. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She had, yeah. she had she had some personality. I wish that she could have gotten more screen time. My favorite line in the movie: "Get that damn screwdriver out of my head." <laughs> haven't, haven't we all been there? Oh yeah. Totally. <laughs> they uh they did a pretty cool thing with uh, the effects because they knew they had to make so many zombies. Like what they did was just make like several faces and then have them be kind of modular, so you could like mm. rearrange things. Uh, I thought that was a pretty cool thing that I learned on the special features. Well, that's kind of smart, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, Jill, did you have anything else that you wanted to say about the film? No, I mean, other than Dane's comment of my Michael Jackson, it was it was just funny. The reason I reacted, which okay. he didn't say, was it was during the first movie, he was like, wouldn't it be awesome if they all just broke out in the Michael Jackson thriller dance? He said it like twice. And so I just like disregarded it because I was like, well, obviously that's not going to happen. And then in this film, like out of nowhere, I see freaking thriller. And I'm like, what? (laughs) (laughs) I was like, and he's like, that's hilarious. I'm like, of all things that could have freaking happened in this film, it's this. So that's why I reacted. I didn't I did appreciate it. I thought it was funny. I thought it was hilarious. And all for parodies and gimmicks and like Easter eggs. I love Easter eggs. But I think the reason I reacted is because I heard, you know, comments all throughout it. Wouldn't it be great? And then all of a sudden it happens and I'm like, oh my God, I'm freaking kidding me. So that's why I reacted. <laughs> well, you, you predicted all the cliches, like the car won't start and... I actually, it was so funny because in the beginning I was like, they were driving. And I think it's just because it's it's a sad part of being a film producer. I predict stuff. I see how it's written. I just, if I'm writing something, I'm going to predict it. I'm going to see it in my head. I'm going to make it come to fruition. And so in the beginning of the film, when they were driving and I saw the tanks like kind of getting loose, I was like, he's going to hit a pothole and it's going to fall out. <laughs> and 30 seconds later, he hits a pothole and it falls out. And I was like, you know what? It's going to land in water. It landed in water. And then I was like, you know what? The only thing that would make this happen is if it starts to rain. And what did it do? It started to rain. I was like, I, I was like, I'm done. I'm absolutely well, done. Well, you saw, you saw the movie before, though. Like, uh, so yes. of course you're going to be able to predict what's going to happen. Of I mean, Exactly. Well, and I think that's why I was like, you know, when I was talking today and I was like, I feel like I'm watching the same movie and so I kind of came up with like my own plot. Like, how can we take what we saw in the first one and like take what people expect and change it? And I was just like, okay. And I came up with a few ideas, but I didn't direct it. So it's whatever. But if I had, I had a few ideas. 
Spencer you had the driver uh, firing up a doobie and getting more droopy at each shot. Yeah. Let, let's see if we can't re uh, remake uh, a, a Return of the Living Dead too. Oh my gosh, we should do it. <laughs> I'd rather just I'd rather well, just make a brand new zombie movie like something that truly hasn't been done before. Which I think we just with take the vault that with the, whole. Take well, the, the whole the film and do the edits and re-edit the actual oh. film and I, I, make the movie that we want out of what they already shot because there's so many really good scenes and really good stuff in there. It's just kind of the spin that's been put on it. We could totally make it a super badass movie if we, if we just re-edited it. I we we'd need I, some. We would need I, some different footage, you know, besides what was already shot, you know. You know what? Actually, though, from my first, from the first movie, that and, and for some reason, this was just one of the things that I happened to pick up on when I was writing emails. I don't know names. I don't know if she had a name, but it was the um, the corpse that had. She was just like, I can feel myself rotting, and she kept talking. It was like basically sternum and like lungs and a head. I don't know. Yeah, I was in corpse. Really. I feel like we should bring her back. I feel like she had personality and the moment this make like a thing. And like instead of rain, like causing all of them to come back to life, we come up with a whole new way like for them to come back to life. And people don't see it coming, but it's there. You well, just the, the trioxin see. is kind of the the trioxin animating the zombies is kind of the key to the whole Return of the Living Dead uh, concept. It, it could be a it could be a fertilizer. It could be like a Monsanto kind of uh, you know shady it business could be the practice. Same concept, thing. but in like incognito. You know what I mean? Like it's just not obvious. Like as soon as it starts raining, they're all gonna come back. It's like it starts raining, but then it stops, and it's like, are they come back? We don't know. Find out in the next sequel. That. Dun, dun, dun. You know what I mean? Like, is that exactly what? What, what kind of content first do you produce again? <laughs> what? What kind of content do you produce again? Well, right now I'm producing a web series based on comics. So. <laughs> <laughs> but you never know. Art is art. You can come up with anything. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think to myself, I look at this film and though I, as I said, I had seen stuff that I had seen many times before in that time period, it's something that is unique to that time period of the mid to late 80s and early 90s. You never quite see these types of PG type horror films anymore. And there is a there's a charisma about them and just a general enjoyment. It's not a movie that you're going to sit back and say, this is, you know, the best movie of all time. But it's a movie that you can sit back and actually enjoy. For the most part, you can have family along with. It's, like I say, it's in general, I think, an enjoyable film. And for that, it, it does hold a somewhat special place in the series. It's enjoyable to a point for uh, for me. Like if I were to watch Return of the Living Dead, I would immediately watch the second one. It, it, it just a, it, you know, be, it, because it, you want to do a marathon. You know? What is happening in the background right now? Microwave or something, I guess. Oh. oh, sorry, I'm baking brownies and my oven is preheated, <laughs> so don't panic, uh, anyone. Oh, oh. To the class. Special brownies. <laughs> well, that's that's okay. Um, I mean, I mostly I I kind of had that same experience. Like when I first saw this, it was like right after I watched the first one, uh, which is kind of why like I made a mistake in last week's episode when I said one of my favorite lines was the you know who's the president Harry Truman thing when one of the zombies tries to take someone out on the phone. That's from this one. Like I could have I thought it was from the first one. Yeah, it was. I watched them back to back. It, 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 it was from the first one because that's when they uh, they asked because uh, 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 well no no they... it was not from the first one that yeah. line is from the second one in the hospital he calls on the phone and he's like oh the zombies are gone you can come back now and I'm like oh who's the president Harry Truman? the zombies like uh Harry Truman because <laughs> he doesn't fucking know uh and that was that was great that was one of the like little things that 
really kind of redeemed the movie because, I mean, it was described as a chase movie. So, like, the zombies are reanimated. They're coming for, every, they're coming for the main cast. And the whole movie is basically them just on the run. So there's not a whole lot of, like, plot to that. So a couple minutes ago, uh, tying a couple ideas together, uh, Katie gave me an idea for a horror comedy. Has anyone done a zombie film where the zombie outbreak starts from a really bad batch of brownies? Well, that uh, they did. Well, they yeah, they kind of did with did Billy they? and Mandy. They um, had them with su- supernatural brownies, and the zombies come out wanting brownies. Ah, okay. I keep thinking there's something called Bong of the Dead that would involve that. There's a bong of the dead, but I don't know if that's. Uh, I'm that sure the, it's crappy all the same. That a crossover with Evil Bong? <laughs> There's sure. a series that should be covered. Have to mix in Hansel and Gretel, or uh, Gretel get baked. Uh, <laughs> did anybody see, did anybody see that new series, Disenchantment, that just came out on Netflix? Yeah, um, it's like that's. <laughs> That's part of an episode, like Hansel and Gretel are characters that they run into, and they're like cannibal. They're like cannibals who locked the witch like in the closet and like just wanted to eat people. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of cool actually. Uh, the series is the series is okay, but it's got some really good memorable stuff in it. <laughs> All right. So, did anyone else have anything else to add? Ah. Uh... Mm. This this was one of the movies that kind of turned, um, like, the main character who, for the fucking life of me, I can't remember, um, he was he was one of the guys who returned from the first movie. Um, he played Tommy Tom in Matthews. Part of this. Tom, Tom Matthews. Matthews. Tom Matthews didn't really do a whole lot of projects after this. Like, this one was handled so poorly that it kind of turned him off of acting. Hmm. At least that was the impression that he gave in some of the interviews. Um, uh, like he's on the record as having said the best part of this movie was craft service. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, Did, get you know what that is zero percent on Rotten Tomatoes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the critics really hated this. I mean, it does have sweet poster art and a handful of like wonderful jokes, but I can I could kind of see why people really wouldn't like it, especially mm-hmm. if they're expecting like another like Dan O'Bannon town level exercise. Actually. You know, uh, you know, t- uh, uh, Tom uh, M- uh, uh, Matthews, the, uh, the guy he uh, um, uh, who played Joey. He's actually yes. in the Never Hike Alone uh, yeah. fan film that's coming out of uh, Friday the Thirteenth. So yeah, I, that was really cool to get him. We got him as a surprise, like at the end. And I was like, wait, is that really him? Because he's so much older now, and he hasn't appeared in anything. I am he really looks the same though. Quite a while. He does. I mean, he's just got grayer hair. But I, I was like, he shows it as his first bet in the game, the Friday the Thirteenth game, the first credits in eight years. He does do the voice too. Kind of makes me wonder, like, what he's up to now that he's not really an actor anymore. Like, does he just go to like? Friday the Thirteenth conventions, or he, he should. Probably. He actually just uh, just he he played uh, Tommy Jarvis in Friday the Thirteenth the video game. Yeah, we were just thought we just mentioned that. So, yeah, he's uh, he, he's only been in two things rec- uh, recently. Uh, in two thousand one, he was in a video shirt called the Vampire Hunters Club. So. Yeah. I think the last movie th- uh, that he was in uh, in was 1998. It was called Sorcerers. Called what? Sorcerers. It was Sorcerers. Uh, nope, no, Sorcerers. Okay. It was no. Okay. That's an impressive cast. Very impressive. Huh. Anyway, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, I think on that note, uh, we're gonna uh, end the discussion. So um, why don't we start? Uh, I think I think we've covered a lot of bases here. So, oh yeah, there was a lot to cover with this movie, and you could probably we could probably go into a deeper dive. But I think we've covered everything that's really like important to it. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Um, why don't we start with so the supposedly doctor? the director. 
Supposedly the director wrote this screenplay like in a screenplay like work for a screenplay workshop and was like really excited. Oh, I got to work with some famous guy. Uh, and yet, you know, yeah, I wrote the script and it was fun and I had help, but it's such such a large amount of it is kind of ripped off from the the first movie. It makes you like, "Eh, this was your best shot. Come on." Uh, well, Dustin, why don't you uh, start and uh, 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 tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Well, uh, I'm Dustin, so I live here in Milwaukee, and I collect movies and anything related to horror. I have an Instagram for the collection, which I'm hoping to start updating more regularly soon. Uh, DHR Hunter, all one word on Instagram. Um, so, plus, I also do... I'm supposed to be an editor for Inside Movies Galore, and I'm doing some movie reviews coming up fairly soon. I also kind of preliminarily launched my own YouTube channel where I'm going to try to do, like, unboxing, uh, like, collection videos, kind of stuff of that nature, just showing off the collection in a bit more detailed way. Uh, I'm also going to... I'm going to try producing some more content for uh, Brandon's channel... As kind of a test for those kinds of, you know, oh, here's this cool thing I found. Brah. I'm going to talk about it for a few minutes for that kind of content. Um, so plus I also do another podcast on Thursdays called Pop Culture Weekly, where me and someone else from Milwaukee, from Milwaukee discuss like current events like in pop culture or just kind of whatever we feel like. So sometimes we might do a movie discussion, sometimes we might do a comics discussion. It kind of depends on whether or not anything really happened in, uh, like, pop culture news. For example, I think our first episode was on the James Gunn controversy, uh, followed by Frank, followed by frankly bad person getting punched at Gen Con and like what happened with that. So mm -hmm. that's the kind of stuff that we talked about. Okay. Uh, and I also uh, just got into the graduate school for biology at UWM, which had been a dream of mine for a long time. So uh, it's kind of an exciting time to be alive. Hooray! Hooray. Hey. I do have other hey. problems to handle, though, so they're taking a lot of the fun out of it. <laughs> All righty. Uh, uh, going over to Jill. Jill, uh, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? What's this? All right. Um, so my name is Jillian, and to put it lightly, I'm a recording artist and film producer, model, and actress. Right now, I am the executive producer and creator of a new web series called Asylum Origins Harley, based on DC Comics character Harley Quinn, as well as acting in it as well. Um, recording an album, and very was honored to be chosen for the newest trauma film. Um, I will be doing the newest song for trauma as well as doing the music video for their film. Um, That'd be Shakespeare's uh, Shitstorm. That's right. That's right. We take their Shitstorm and the song will be traumatic. You've heard it here first. I haven't even told my fans about it, but I will be launching a song called Hashtag Traumatic, and it's based on trauma. So that'll be coming out soon. Um, outside of that, I'm basically, I run two companies. My first company is Literati Entertainment. It's an event coordination company, as well as a modeling company, like promotional modeling booking agency, as well as um, a second company is a film production company, which is what we're doing this show under. Um, when I'm not working, I'm working, so just doing minor photo shoots in between of my album and dealing with staying on a daily basis, which is my greatest pride and joy, and I'm having fun, so let's do, let's do it. <laughs> awesome. What's um, going on with everybody's audio? It sounds like they're taking, like, a submarine down to the depths. <laughs> it's because I am in the depths. I'm actually underwater right now. You just don't even know it. Ah, oh, I see. Well, yeah. hopefully you encounter the beast. Mm. Yeah, no, I have a cave under here. I've had. I actually have an underwater mansion. And um, if you ever stop by, you're welcome to stop by and chill out. 
I'm actually underwater right now. I'm actually a mermaid, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> We've, been We've had lots this of experience before. with mermaids. <laughs> yeah, we did. We did mermaid films not too long ago. Are you like? Are you like the murdery kind of mermaid, or? I'm actually, well, the funny thing is with all of my films, I play a psychopath and I keep trying to play a funny person. And like my dream, I do not, is like to be Melissa McCarthy because I think she's the most funny person ever. And I oh think, oh my God, really? Like, I think she's the funniest person ever. And that's just, it's, I, I, I have this sense of humor. I have like a dry humor. So like that's what I'm like, I gravitate towards is the dry humor, which is probably why I ended up in the trauma film. Uh, but, I think uh, Melissa McCarthy is maybe the last place I would go for humor. Well, you haven't I, seen her I, good roles. I think she's hilarious, but yes, if I were to be a mermaid, I don't think I would be the murdery type of mermaid. I'd probably be really shiny, have a tiara, like be like gaudy and be shiny, but at the same time, people are like, what's wrong with her? And I just don't answer. And then I swim away and hang out in my mansion, and that's what I do. This has been an interesting tangent. <laughs> <laughs> Take it one step further, Dustin. You were talking about disenchantment. Did you see the murder uh, mermaid lurking from there? What? <laughs> I, I could only I could hear like only murmuring. What was that? Oh, yeah. like the thing with the with the siren island. The sirens, like, the walruses. Yeah. I kind of miss. I've had a miss a fair amount of that episode. <laughs> that was like doing dishes or something. <laughs> uh, I've been meaning to revisit the se to revisit the episodes that I wasn't paying a whole lot of attention to. Uh, like the show, the show is fairly decent quality. It's it's kind of a lot like the Futurama was when it went off the air. Mm -hmm. It's got most of the same people involved, like the whole like Matt Groening kind of team. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's about as good as some of the later seasons of Futurama, maybe slightly less. It's like a solid seven, maybe an eight. All righty. Uh, Brandon, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Well, um, well, my name is Brandon. I run a channel called uh, Septum Sen versus the World. And uh, we talk about physical. We are all about physical media. And, of course, the many things one can do with uh, physical media. Uh, we uh, are currently in the process of making various top 15 lists, um, and uh, we hope to be working on more of those soon. And, of course, occasional partnerships with uh, Inside Movies Galore, uh, such as a hopefully upcoming uh, collaboration on uh, more mermaid stuff, uh, oddly enough. And um, More Edison a, stuff, eventually. I had no idea there were so many mermaid movies before we did that whole thing. <laughs> But uh, as it is, uh, we are trying to do that. And, of course, uh, I also do occasional uh, reviews for Inside Movies Galore as well. Uh, I think the – I cannot remember the last one. I, oh, wait, the last one I did was um, Agretzko, which is a uh, interesting uh, YouTube series uh, that was um, – not YouTube, uh, Netflix series that had caught my eye. <laughs> cool. Um uh, Katie, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself, what you do? Sure, I'm Katie Cadaver from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I am a body positive horror artist and alternative model. You can find me at patreon.com slash Katie Cadaver or on Instagram at 3RDEYE0PEM. I'm also the makeup artist for horror punk band Rat Bat Spider. You can listen to them at ratbatspider.bandcamp.com. And I am a dead girl for Dead Girls Dark Coffin Classics Horror TV Show. You can watch episodes at vimeo.com slash ddcc. I also perform and produce for Grindhouse Tees Burlesque Productions. You can find us at facebook.com slash grindhouse tees. And you can also see me uh, performing on September 1st in Madison, Wisconsin at the Broom Street Theater with Gone Rogue Burlesque and special guest Smash. And I also am a Tromet with Troma Entertainment. And you can vid visit me at the Troma booth this weekend at Horror Hound and Mass Fest in downtown Indianapolis at the JW Marriott that runs from Friday through Sunday. Whee! Um, oh my god, whose audio is that? 
Jake, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. All right, I'm Jake, a.k.a. Kotobuki Jake. I join uh, uh, Brandon frequently on Septum Sin versus the World uh, and just, you know, help out with the various reviews, commentary on the world of entertainment and so forth. Uh, I also have my own channel dedicated more to uh, nature uh, videos, but I've only posted a few so far. I've got a couple that I'm kind of working on hopefully get posted soon. Um, otherwise, spend a very large percentage of my time either working or uh, trying to read or write or view various things, like uh, this film. <laughs> um, and I guess that, that, that'll do it. <laughs> awesome. Um Going over to uh, Red Raven, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do? I'm Red Raven from Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, and I book shows in the Milwaukee area. And I'm also a dead girl at Dead Girls Dark Coffin Classics. And you can find us on Vimeo.com slash DDCC. Awesome. Uh, and uh, Dane, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? I'm Dane Kyle. I'm an independent filmmaker based out of Charlotte, North Carolina, and um, directing the web series with Jill. And um, what else am I doing? Just got other projects kind of in the works behind the scenes. I have two short films that got included in... Uh, Hex Media's horror anthology feature film, For We Are Many, and then I had another one included in another horror anthology feature film, Clown Exploitation, both of which should come out um, either later this year or sometime next year. And uh, the one in Clown Exploitation actually had me acting alongside Jill, which was nice. Awesome. Very nice. And uh, my name is David Stregge. I run this uh, uh podcast uh and uh i also blog at uh movies galore of milwaukee um uh but lately i've been do uh, doing some video reviews uh, lately so check out um some of the last uh, 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 last review reviews uh, uh, i've done uh, if you if you can uh, take a look and uh i believe the last one that i di uh, did was on a film from the uk called uh uh Learning Hebrew, a goth exploitation film. So uh, <laughs> definitely check that out. Um, and uh, um, so on and so forth. So um, uh, also, um, if you haven't yet, uh, pick up your copy of Wrestle Massacre. You can fi uh, find, uh, find it fairly easy, probably on Fuzzy Monkey f uh, f uh, Films uh, uh, Facebook page. It's fairly cheap. So definitely check that add that out. I am one of the producers behind that. So. Um, and uh, next week, uh, stay tuned as we uh, figure out the next film for next week. So uh, everyone, say good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.